Good morning. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Welcome. For those of you who are able to stand, please do so at this time so we can join together in the call to worship. The Lord is king. Let the nations tremble. Let all people praise your great and holy name. You are a mighty king, O God, a lover of justice. You have shown what is right and fair in all the earth. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, O Worship the King. It's number 73 in the hymnal, and the words are in your bulletin. seated. When we gather to worship, we open ourselves to the possibility that God will have something to say to us. We come knowing our need of grace and seeking God's presence for our lives. Let us join in the prayer of confession and renewal, followed by a time of silent prayer. Eternal God, from the beginning, you have called your children into communion with you. You reach out to us in love and seek to welcome us with open arms. Yet we know that like others, we have turned to our own way and refused your love and grace. Restore us to the joy of knowing you and of recognizing your presence among us through Jesus Christ, bringer of your good news. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God's grace is wider than all the earth. Friends, let us believe the gospel that in Jesus Christ we are free to live, for we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen.
least take a moment to greet one another before you sit down. It's nice to see us having such a great time with one another. Well, as you might have figured out, I am not Jonathan or April. I am Kathy Platnick, and I'm here today to help facilitate our service. Jonathan is not with us because he performed a wedding last or yesterday for Valerie Geiger, and he wanted me to be sure to tell you all how excited he was to have two weddings in one month with brides he has known since they were four years old. So he's uh, very excited. They're very good friends with the Geiger family, so they stayed overnight. Jonathan will be back for the 5.30 service tonight. And of course, April is continuing her leave of absence in New York, spending concentrated time with her grandson. So today we are thrilled to, rec uh, um, to welcome the Reverend John Woodall. Uh, John has uh, been at a number of large Methodist churches. He's been, he's been around as long as April and, jo and Jonathan. They all got ordained together. But he has served at uh, Pasadena, uh, sorry, uh, Pasadena First, he's served at Santa Monica First, and uh, Westwood United Methodist Churches. But for the last several years, he's actually been president of the California Pacific United Methodist Foundation. And he'll tell you a little bit more about what that means and what it is. Our letter just today is Marietta Fung, who's been with the church for many, many years and serves us in so many capacities and particularly is very helpful in our worship services. services. Uh, and she continues to, she's retired from paid work, as I like to call it, and now is doing good works and doing a number of things in the community. And her daughter, Paula, is the person who runs the music for our third service. So we're delighted to have the whole family with us. Our altar flowers today are given uh, from Will William and Gretchen Lewis in memory of their perfect brother, and from Joan Davidson in memory of her daughter, Cynthia McPhee, who would have turned 60 this past Wednesday. Now, there's a lot going on in the church over the next week or two, so I want to give you an update. First off is this afternoon at 2 o'clock. There will be a hymn sing performed by our choir and other members of the community, and they'll be joined by the Inner City Youth Orchestra. That is a free program, so after the service, you can go grab a bite to eat and come on back. I know that's what a lot in the choir are going to do. <laughs> and then um, on tomorrow night, our missions committee is um, hosting a, a program featuring Catherine Parker. She is one of the missionaries our church supports. She'll be here to talk about her work in Nepal. She does a lot of work with women in Nepal. That's at 7 o'clock tomorrow night in the Alders Gate Room. On Wednesday night, we have our uh, quarterly ad board conference. That's the business meeting of the church. All are welcome. Uh, you don't have to be a member of that board to, be, to attend. They are considering having it in person this time, which we haven't done for quite some time. Um, if it's in person, it'll be in the choir room. Otherwise, it'll be on Zoom. Socializing starts at 7.15. Meeting starts at 7.30 if you are interested in attending feel free to contact the office and they'll, they'll, they'll um, hook you up with wherever it's going to be. Then next Sunday is our annual celebration Sunday. That's the day when we celebrate our mission and our place in the world and think about our gratitude for all we have and our thoughts about where we want to head in the next year. Uh, we traditionally do food on celebration Sunday and this year is no different. We will be doing brunches for the morning services and then it's the last Sunday, so the evening service will be taco night. Um, no need to make reservations this year. Just come and enjoy and be part of the celebration. And then lastly, Peggy wanted me to remind you that uh, the first Sunday in November is always All Saints Sunday. That will be November 5th this year. And on All Saints Sunday, we celebrate and remember the lives of those we have lost this past year. So if there's someone in your life who you would like to remember and celebrate on that day, please let the office know. You can call and let Peggy know to put them on the list, and then we'll be ready to go when we get to November 5th. And that's all the excitement happening this week. Now I'd like to invite the children up, and Deborah's going to do our sermon.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, good to see you. Come on up, Joseph. All right. All right. Well, good morning. Today, I want to talk to you all about being thankful. We all have lots of things to be thankful for, but sometimes I think we don't realize how much we really need to be thankful for. Sometimes we forget all the things that we have, and sometimes we only pray to God when we want something. So today, I'm excited to share with you my thankful box. So first of all, let me show you a juice box. It's a juice box, but it's not full. It's empty. And I'm thankful that whoever got this juice box drank it and was able to quench their thirst. I'm also thankful that it had a straw so they didn't have to squeeze it and get it all over themselves. I'm thankful that I picked it up off the ground and so it wasn't littering the earth so we can reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? Also thankful that this probably might have been in a refrigerator, so it was cold when someone drank it. Refrigerators are awesome, and we thank God for those. I have a few other things to show you. What is this? What is this? It's not a rope. Oh my gosh, this must mean I'm really old if you guys don't know what this is. This is a shoelace. <laughs> this is a shoelace. Now, if I didn't have this shoelace on, not the shoes I'm wearing today, but if I didn't have this on my sneakers, my shoe would fall off. So I am thankful for shoelaces. And some of you are probably thankful for Velcro shoes, right? Now, I'm thankful for a washing machine because I can throw this dirty lace in there, get it all nice and clean again and put it on my shoe. And I'm also thankful that I have fingers because you need fingers to tie these. Now, do all of you, well, some of you have, have Velcro, but do some of you have shoes with laces? Yes? Do you know how to tie them? Well, then you need to make sure you thank your parents or your grandparents, or your teachers for showing you how to tie your laces because your shoes would fall off if you didn't have them. Now I also have something else. You're like, what is that? It's a Tupperware container. This is very important. And I'm very thankful for this Tupperware container because I made meatballs a few weeks ago and I had the leftovers in here and the next day, I could bring this in and have the leftovers here at work. And sometimes leftovers taste better the second time. After this was cleaned and put away, maybe, I don't know, a few days later, maybe a week, I was able to put a piece of chocolate birthday cake in here. <gasps> we give thanks for chocolate cake, right? And we thank God for our birthday. And we thank God that we have refrigerators to keep things cold. Now, all of these things are just a few things to be thankful for, but we have many, many things to be thankful for. But the most important thing to be thankful for is that God is with us every day in our lives, and he can guide you because he's in your heart. And we're going to give thanks to God right now by saying a prayer. So let's put our hands together. Here we go. God in heaven, God in heaven. Hear, our hear our prayer. Keep us in, Keep us in. Your, loving care. your loving care. Be our guide, Be our guide. In, all we do. in all we do. And bless all those, bless all those. Who, love who love us too. Amen. All right, now let's be thankful we got Sunday school. Let's go.
At the beginning of his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul tells them that he always gives thanks to God for all of them and mentions them in his prayers constantly. Paul was an excellent example of how we can serve one another in prayer. Unfortunately, we have a number of new additions to our prayer list this week. Uh, Jean Kester has decided to forego further chemotherapy and is going to join Comfort Care. Marty Maradian is in, a, is in an Addisonian crisis, which is life-threatening, and is trying to find an endocrinologist that can see her immediately for treatment. There are also a number of members and friends of the congregation um, who have joined the Saints in Light. Um, Pat Howard, the mother of our member, Emily Howard, joined the Saints yesterday afternoon while Emily was out of town on business. Pat's health had been declining for quite some time. John Fike, the father of Karen Anderson and husband of Mary, passed away early last Sunday with both of his daughters present. His service will be on Monday, October 30th at 4 p.m. Connie Davenport, a member who moved to Orange County just before COVID, also left this earth last Sunday. Her service will be Sunday, November 5th at 1 p.m. Carolyn Oberparleteur suffered another stroke Wednesday night and joined her maker Thursday evening. Um, Carolyn was an active member of our hospitality team and will be joining her husband, Wayne, who died this past year. Dita Lance breathed her last on Tuesday night while on hospice care. She was a friend who joined us this past year for worship and has been on our prayer list and in our hearts. Larry Riley, who's also been on our prayer list, died this week as well. He is the father of Chris Larson's sister-in-law. And lastly, Bob Bailiff. Sorry. Um, Bob, uh, Bob finished his course of faith yesterday. Bob was in our choir for many years. Um, uh, Jonathan reports that on his last visit, Bob said to him, I want a memorial service that's light and fun and filled with music. So isn't that lovely? We will continue to remember all of these folks with fondness and happiness for their time on earth. Now let us enter into time of prayer. O oh God of infinite grace, amid the turmoil in the world, we are grateful today for the light of your blessedness that shines upon us. It streams through the sanctuary windows and our windows at home bringing us a needed peace that comforts us and restores our souls. You see us as we are today, not as who we were yesterday or before. You are the God of our most important moments as well as our most perplexing predicaments. When it seems as though we or the people of the world have lost their way, you are there to light our path and guide us to a better outcome. Our sins are forgiven, our shame is canceled, and we can unburden ourselves from any disgrace in our past. Your grace gives us wings to soar. Illuminate the beauty and dignity in every person so that we see you rather than notice their brokenness and inconsistencies. And when we do see their weaknesses, may we do so with compassion and understanding. Ailments, aging, and serious medical challenges confront many, including in this body of Christ. May your existence and presence be of comfort to the friends and families of Bob Bailiff, Pat Howard, John Fike, Connie Davenport, Carolyn Oberparleter, Dina Lance, and Larry Riley, and may you also be with Jean Kester, Marty Moradian, Jim Donahue, Christina DeLuca, Bonnie Jo Bonagos, Liesel Droche, Bill Lotto, Andy Miller, 
Ron Jones, Joan Green, Sally Whitney, Andy Penn, and others who we name silently or hold in our hearts. Encourage these children of yours to deposit themselves into your safekeeping and entrust that this deposit will yield eternal dividends. Forgive us for allowing the ways of the world to overwhelm us. There are unspeakable acts of inhumanity being rained upon those in Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, and other areas of the world. Our failure to faithfully steward your creation has led to extreme climate events that evoke fear, pain, and darkness, especially right now in Afghanistan. There are many struggling to afford food for their family or to find a safe place to sleep at night. May the depth of your grace and compassion visit each of them in their time of need and bring them the strength to endure great suffering and hardship. Lead those in power toward a just and noble future that makes a positive rather than destructive impact on the world. Father, you have admonished us not to worry, but sometimes that result is hard to achieve when things seem so out of control. We may feel that the human world offers nothing but upheaval, but we are nourished by your immeasurable gift, the sacrifice of your son on the cross. He carried us then, and he continues to carry us to this day, sharing in our burdens, our hopes, our challenges, and our triumphs. Allow us to temper our dismay over so much tragedy and death with the upbeat blessings of young marital unions. Remind each of us that it, there is always some spot of brightness in the day. We just have to open ourselves to finding it. Help us to remember that all we are and all we have are gifts from you, gifts to be shared in service and love. Encourage each of us to be a consistent source of your light for all those around us as we pray together the prayerful words of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our congregation shares generosity in a variety of ways. Some contribute to God's mission here in the sanctuary, others by mail or electronic transfer. We dedicate these gifts and the spirit behind them now in prayer. Gracious God, you bless our lives each day. You surround us with your goodness and encourage us with your grace. You seek to bring healing and hope to all your children. Accept the gifts we offer, that they may touch others with your compassion and care. Amen.
be seated. This morning's gospel follows the return of the disciples after their first missionary journeys. Jesus hears their reports and then leads them away from the demands of the crowds. They get on board a boat and head off for a brief retreat. When they get to their destination, they find that the crowd is waiting for them. Jesus has awakened a sense of hope that has been lying dormant, and the people of the area cannot wait to see him. In the midst of the desert, he attends both to their spiritual and physical hunger. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44, may be found on page 50 of the New Testament portion of your Bibles. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. Thus ends the reading of the gospel. Well, good morning, friends. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, your pastor Jonathan and I go a ways back as to April. We were all ordained together uh, 38 years ago. So for, I guess, active clergy, that almost makes us relics. You know, I think we're a little bit in relic status as far as the conference goes now, but it's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here. And I bring you greetings also from the California Pacific United Methodist Foundation. Um, our foundation is a nonprofit entity that's been doing business with local churches in this annual conference for over 80 years. Uh, and the things that we focus on at the foundation are doing investment, investment services for local church. We also do a great deal of education in local churches with stewardship education, how to run finance committees and all of that kind of thing. So I'm constantly out doing seminars uh, in that area. And we also do a lot of direct work with individuals to help them in their personal philanthropy through planned giving. So we see our mission as an opportunity to work with local churches to help build the financial foundation uh, so that ministry can happen in all of our local settings. Uh, it's work I really enjoy, I'm very passionate about, uh, and it's a pleasure to get to be here with you today. Uh, would you pause with me now for a moment of prayer? 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength, our hope, and our rock. When you think of the word abundance, what is it that comes to mind? In my mind, when I hear the word abundance, there's a quick translation that takes place to a word that's part of my Italian heritage, abbondanza. When I think about my Italian family and their approach to life, I think of abbondanza, abundance. It could mean an abundance of gusto for life. It might mean an abundance of the numbers of people that would gather on Sunday afternoons for supper and card games or people that would gather for significant life events. And I can particularly think of abundance, the abundance of all the noise from everybody talking at the same time in full voices. But when I think of abundance, I most associate it with my nonna, my Italian grandmother and her generosity to her friends, her family, especially with Nona's approach to food and hospitality. Now, she came to this country as a young woman after losing her first husband and first child, and she left behind a life of poverty on the farm, as did so many. She met my Nono in Chicago and started a family where my mom and aunt were born, and they, like many other Italians, tired of the winters and decided to move to Los Angeles. Well, they came here and lived in Los Angeles for many years, but my Nono died before my parents married, so I never got to meet him. And this meant that my Nona was a widow for almost 40 years of her adult life. Now, if there is anyone who should have believed in scarcity, it was her. But that was not the case. Her home was not a place of sadness or scarcity. It was a place of abundanza. Whenever you would visit her house, you would never know it was a household of one when you were looking in her kitchen. When she cooked, there was always more than enough. And my wife, Linda, and I still remember that we would get calls when we were first married, inviting us to drop by and to pick up some food that she had prepared. Oh, I made a little meatloaf, she might say. And when we would arrive, we would see that her idea of little meant anywhere from five to 10 pounds of meatloaf. Abundanza. In the 70 years that my Nona lived in this country, she never learned to drive. And so she relied on the transportation of others. So guess what happened when you turned 16 and you got your driver's license? You were now one of Nona's chauffeurs. And that meant that my sister and I were often recruited to help with her errands. Now, errands were a very interesting thing from Nona because you never went to just one place. You would first go to the regular grocery store. Then you would go to Claro's, the local Italian market for certain things. And then you would go to the dairy stand because you never bought your milk at the grocery store. It wasn't fresh enough. You had to get it at the dairy stand. And then after that, we would usually go from place to place to pay her bills. So that's how you did it. It was an event. That's all there was to it. Then at the end of that, when you thought you were done, she would usually say, oh, I have something for Maria or Doretta or some of the other local Italians. So it meant you would next deliver complete meals that she had prepared for them or trays of baked goodies. I guess she was her own Italian version of Meals on Wheels. Again, it was that sense of abundanza. Cooking was one of her gifts, and she freely shared that generosity with others, whether it was the meatloaf or it was the Sunday dinner with plate after plate after plate of delectable food for all who would come into her home. It was something I took for granted then, and I only realize now just how amazing it was. Her practice of generosity, of abundanza, was something she passed on to her two daughters, and I believe it's been passed on to successive generations. 
And it was a very, very important life lesson that she taught us. We had a choice. We could choose to live out of a sense of scarcity, where it was our job to protect and to hide anything that we might have. Or we could choose to live out of a sense of abundanza. It meant there will be enough. It meant that there would always be possibility. There would always, always be potential. It really is a great question for people of faith. Am I living out of a sense of scarcity? Or do I live out of a sense of abundance? Our answer to that question is formed by so many things. It may depend on the family systems from which we come. It may be influenced deeply by our friends and our coworkers. It may depend on how the economic system has treated our people. There are many, many forces at work which have a deep stake in our adopting one attitude or other in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in our nation, in our world. If we look at the economic systems the human family has created, they are frequently based on creating scarcity, hoarding, if you will. And that runs far, far back into our human history. What is important to consider is that our ability to live out of scarcity or abundance is not necessarily tied to our perceived wealth or lack of. You see, when we live out of a sense of scarcity, we are much more self-focused. We are much more self-absorbed. It's all about me. And so often we worry that something bad is always just about to happen. That's what it's like when we live out of a sense of scarcity. Abundant living, on the other hand, it's much more outwardly focused. It sees possibilities. One of these attitudes may help us to be hospitable to be welcoming, to be committed to the good of the community, the other may instead engender in us a sense, a deep sense of distrust of others, reinforcing those real and metaphorical walls which separate us. More and more, our Christian faith seems to be tangled up in the debates surrounding our attitudes about scarcity and abundance. Is our faith, is the faith that you and I practice one that emphasizes grace and hope and abundance, or is the faith we practice one that breeds fear and distrust of each other? Do we practice a faith that is focused on Jesus and his message? Or has he been set aside and replaced with our modern demagogues? So when we try to consider all of that, where do we turn? Well, we turn, as we always do, to familiar stories like the one we heard read this morning, the one in Mark's gospel. And I always love Mark's gospel because he has such an economy of words. He's straight and to the point. And you can quickly sum up the narrative of what happened. We know that the disciples had been busy doing this work of spreading the good news. It was their first missionary journey. And at the end of all of that work, they were tired. And Jesus understood that they were tired. So their job was to find a place to retreat, to get away from everything they had been doing. And as the gospel writer tells us, their plans were foiled. The crowds found them, and before they knew it, 5,000 people had gathered around them. And Jesus, 
in his inevitable way, began to teach. Once again, and I suspect that teaching, that teaching was probably at the displeasure of the disciples because they thought, we're done for the day, no more. Well, that's not what happened, does the story tell us? And the dilemma, of course, is it wasn't just enough to be teaching. Jesus wanted to be the good host to practice hospitality, and he told the crew of disciples around them, go feed them which seemed impossible given that they only had five loaves of bread and two fish in their possession and nowhere near enough money to go out and to buy provisions for the crowd. See, in that particular story, the disciples were focused on scarcity. Jesus instead was focused on abundance. And it's that point in the narrative where the gospel starts to delve into that realm of what we sometimes call the fantastic, one of those miracles over which people of faith have pondered for centuries. Some would maintain that it's absolutely like it says that magic happened and all this food miraculously appeared. Others might say it never happened. It's just a fanciful story. And then there are those like myself, many who see that there was a different kind of miracle perhaps at work that day. The writer tells us that Jesus gave a blessing and distribution took place. And that blessing and the meager amount of bread and fish became the catalyst for the miracle which happened there. Those who were gathered were caught up, I believe, in a spirit of abundance. And it's not unreasonable to conclude that one person shared and another person decided they had some things that they could share. And before you knew it, everyone was sharing. And this became infectious. And indeed, in a human family, this is a miracle. Whenever a group of people decide and dare to live out of abundance instead of scarcity. And the result, we are told, is that there was more than enough for all. There were 12 baskets of leftovers when it was all done. And as we learn looking at the story, the disciples almost missed the miracle. They had every reason to put up there why Jesus' request to feed those who had gathered could not happen. But he, Jesus, instead of affirming their endless litany of scarcity, was insistent and he said, go feed them. Go feed them. And we know the result. You see, early Christianity practiced and really believed in the power of God's grace to not only transform, but to bring people together. Because God's grace was not scarce, it was abundant. And the earliest stories that we read of the early church emphasizes how the people worked together. They shared with one another in order to build up the whole. That was the goal, building up the whole, sharing of their abundance. Those were the ideas. The sobering reality, unfortunately, for us is that those kinds of ideals so often seem opposite of our humanness. It did not take long for individual insecurities, pettiness, and prejudice to create tension, even in the early church. And that tension continues to exist among us today, a tension whose subtle voice, whose quiet voice, is saying things to us like, there isn't enough. There isn't enough. Only, only worry about yourself. When we look out into the world, we can certainly see how this idea of scarcity is alive and well. And I believe it's that idea of scarcity that causes us to be afraid of one another and continues to contribute to the deep chasms that are being built, separating the human family from itself. Scarcity is at work causing us to have distrust of one another, causing us to close ourselves off from one another. 
and it could be enough to make you just want to give up. But the good news, as is pointed out in this story today, is that God continues to be at work. God continues to be in our midst. God's grace continues to help people to see how generosity and abundant living is core and central to who we are as people of God, who we are as followers of Jesus. God's grace is sufficient and enough to put aside all those fears of scarcity. That's what we're called to do as the church, to be people of generosity, to be people of abundance, to be people of abundanza. Friends, the very fact that we're sitting in a beautiful place like this in a facility is because people before us had a sense of abundance and working together for the common good and what that could create. And we see it in all the places where the church is at work addressing issues of poverty, addressing issues of homelessness, working to try to bring people together. You see, generosity and abundance, that's our DNA. That's who we are as Methodist people. Remember what the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, had to say about resources. He was really clear. He said three things. He said, earn all you can. I like that idea. Earn all you can. Save all you can. We're encouraged to do that. But the most important one, give all you can. That was Wesley's maxim to his followers. And as part of our heritage of who we are, we are called to be people who live out of abundance, people who practice great generosity. Diana Butler Bass is one of my favorite historians. And as far as I'm concerned, she's really a theologian. And she once shared insight on Jesus and this notion of bread and his being the bread of life as she reflected on this same passage from Mark's gospel. And she observed, the bread of life has come. The bread of life has come. Jesus has come. And it sparkles and it bubbles among us. The table is set and the blessing the blessing is proclaimed. This is the wisdom of God, the miracle of Jesus, that all, all will be fed, that the ills of a world based on scarcity are passing, and that the time, the time of abundance is here. Friends, what do we choose? Do we dare to believe that there can be enough and that we can be a part, an integral part of that grace and hope. Do we believe that there is abundanza? What do you think? Amen. Let's rise and join together in our final hymn, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. The words are in your bulletin or on number 381 in your hymnals.
Friends, go from this place today knowing that God calls you. Go from this place today knowing that God's grace is all around you. Go from this place today knowing that you are loved by God. And may that same love be with those you love wherever they may be, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.